Have you ever been excited about a new game only to be disappointed that it lags? I've spent the past six years creating a game engine and I've been shocked at the things that can make or break performance. I'll show four simple optimizations that you can use to make your games run much quicker. And instead of just talking about them, we'll use them to optimize something that's found in a lot of games, voxels. Voxels are these small cubes and this world is composed of millions of them. Right now this runs at 50 frames a second and we'll increase it up to 2500 using the first optimization. If we render these voxels one at a time, we would render this map at one frame a second. That's the opposite of optimization. So instead, we'll group them into chunks of 32. All these voxels now share the same mesh, which lets us render all of them at the same time. We can then combine more chunks together to create a larger world. This works, but it renders very slowly. So let's start optimizing it. If we have a look at the mesh for a chunk, and then zoom in further into a voxel, we can see that it's composed of 12 triangles. That means the entire world is composed of 115 million triangles. The less triangles we have, the faster our game will run, so let's get rid of some. If we look at these two voxels, there's four triangles between them that we'll never be able to see. So when we generate the mesh for this chunk, we'll skip the triangles that are between two voxels. This brings our triangle count down massively to only 1.2 million, but we can reduce it further. If we look at this wall, we can see it's composed of voxels that all have the same metal texture. It looks like a large flat surface, but it's really composed of 1500 triangles. We don't need all these individual triangles, we're better off combining them together. The algorithm for this is too big to fit on screen, but I've put a link to it in the description. We can also combine them sideways, but not until we've done another optimization in step 4. This brings us up to 2500 frames per second, just by reducing the amount of triangles. The next thing we can optimize is what's stored inside each triangle. Every voxel face has two triangles, and each triangle is composed of three vertices. Each of these vertices stores position and normal vectors and a texture ID. This adds up to 28 bytes per vertex, and for the entire world, that's 24 megabytes. Reducing our triangle count increased our performance, and so we're reducing our memory usage. So we'll compress all this data into one integer without losing quality. To start, every vertex needs a position. Currently we're using a vector for this, which holds three floats. These floats are great for standard 3D models because they can store fractional values. But every triangle in our mesh lines up to a grid, so we can use a byte instead. That's a quarter the size of a float, but we can go even smaller. A byte holds 8 bits and can store numbers up to 255, but our chunks are only 32 voxels wide. With 7 bits, our mesh will be half the size at up to 127 voxels wide. With 6 bits, our mesh can be up to 63 voxels wide. And with 5 bits, our mesh can be up to 31 voxels wide, but our chunk can't fit into that. So we'll use 6 bits for each of the X, Y, and Z positions. We can reduce this further, but not until we've done another optimization in step 3. Each vertex also stores a normal vector, which helps us calculate lighting and other effects. This vector stores the direction that each triangle is facing. For example here, all the green triangles are facing up, and all the red triangles are facing left. Since voxels are cubes, there's only 6 possible normals they can have. So we'll store the number 0 for up, 1 for down, 2 for right, and so on. Then in the vertex shader, we can turn this number back into a vector. We can fit these 6 directions inside 3 bits, which is a huge saving. Lastly, each triangle contains a texture ID, which tells the shader which texture to apply. We only have 70 unique textures, so we can store this ID using 7 bits. All the data we need to render a vertex can now fit inside 32 bits, which is the size of one of the floats from the old vectors. But the vertex shader needs to know how to unpack this data into its separate components. We'll use bit masking for this. The top row here is a mask, and matches the number after the AND symbol in the shader. When we apply this mask to our vertex data, we get a new number with only the bits that line up with the mask. To unpack the rest of our data, we'll shift it to the right and then apply the mask again. We now have all our data and can run our shader as usual, but all the chunks are overlapped in the same position. That's because every vertice's position is now in the range 0 to 32. So we need to tell each chunk where it is in the world. To do this, we'll create a world position uniform in the vertex shader and update it before drawing each chunk. The vertex shader then adds this world position to the vertices position. Our world now renders correctly and our memory usage is down to 3.4 megabytes. This increased our frames a second up to 4000 just by reducing the memory usage. But we're still storing more data than we need to. 
If we look at this wireframe, every voxel face has six vertices and two of them have the exact same position. Storing the same data twice feels like a waste. Can we render a voxel face with only four vertices instead? Currently these triangles are rendered individually, which means we need three vertices for each of them. But OpenGL also lets us render triangles as strips, where each extra vertex builds a new triangle off the last. The problem is, everything gets joined together as one long strip. I thought surely there's a way to tell OpenGL to start a new strip every four vertices, but I couldn't find anything. But I found an even better solution. When games render particles, they use instancing. They have a base particle model and a list of positions. And then OpenGL draws this model at all of these positions. We didn't have to create a huge mesh with all these particles in it. And even better, each particle is a triangle strip and they're not joined together. So we'll use instancing to render our voxels. We'll have a base model for the voxel face, which has only four vertices. And then instead of a list of positions, we have a list of our 32-bit voxel data. This voxel data contains everything we used to store in the mesh, but rather than storing it six times for each face, we only have to store it once. But when we render the world, everything is facing up. That's because our base voxel model is facing up. We need to rotate it based on the face direction. In the vertex shader, if the face is up, we'll lift the model up. If it's facing left, we'll rotate it to the side, and the same for the other directions. But if we look at the world, we still have all these gaps. That's because earlier we combined our triangles together and we're no longer storing how long each combined face is. We need to store this length, but we don't have room for another six bits. Thankfully, now that we're using instancing, we can reduce the size of our position data. Before we had to store positions in the range zero to 32, which is 33 unique numbers. But since our base voxel model is already one unit wide, we only need to store positions up to 31. Five bits can store exactly 32 unique numbers, so we're in luck. We also only need five bits to store the length, because each combined face can be up to 32 voxels long. Now in the vertex shader, we could use this length value to stretch out the base voxel model. This reduced our memory usage by a factor of six, down to 580 kilobytes. That's because we're only storing one vertex for each face instead of six. Also, the vertex shader only runs four times for each face because we're using triangle strips. Together, this increased our frames a second up to 6500, and the next optimization will increase it even further. To render this world, we're sending all these commands to the graphics card. This is typical for a game, but we can replace them all with just one. To do this, we need to change the way we store our data. Right now, each chunk has its own list of instance data in its own buffer. This means we need to ask the graphics card to render each of them, one at a time. Instead, we can create one huge buffer and give each chunk a small portion of it. To render a specific part of this buffer, we can use the longest OpenGL function ever created. The first two numbers refer to the four vertices in our base voxel model. The next two numbers refer to the start and length of the part of the massive buffer that we want to draw. If we want to render multiple parts of this buffer, we could repeat this function. But now we're back to multiple draw commands. We could just render the entire combined buffer, but that would render chunks that are outside our field of view. We only want to render chunks that we can actually see. So what we'll do instead is store these parameters in a special kind of buffer called an indirect buffer. Then we can use a second longest OpenGL function to render them all at the same time. But when we draw them, we have that issue from before where they're all overlapped. That's because we can't use shader uniforms anymore to position each chunk. To fix this, we'll use another buffer called a shader storage buffer object. We can store anything we want in this buffer, and in this case we'll store the world position of every chunk we're trying to draw. Each of these commands has a unique ID called GLDrawID. This ID increments for each of our draw commands, so we can use it to select the right position for each chunk. We're now rendering the entire world with one draw command, which increased our frames a second up to 12,000. That's because our CPU spends hardly any time telling the graphics card what to do, and the graphics card has a huge command it can focus on. But 12,000 frames a second isn't the limit. Now that we're using one draw command, we've unlocked two bonus optimizations. The first is related to an optimization that every game uses to ignore triangles that are on the other side of a model. It works by checking if the points in the triangle are going clockwise, and if they aren't, the triangle isn't rendered. This speeds up rendering because we're not wasting time on the triangles that are facing away from us. But the vertex shader still has to run every frame to determine if these triangles are clockwise or not. If we only render the anti-clockwise triangles, we can see there are a lot of them that are facing away from us, 
This means we're running the vertex shader for all these triangles and then just discarding them. But we can stop these triangles from ever reaching the vertex shader. Let's say the player's standing in this blue chunk. We know they'll never be able to see the red triangles in these chunks because they're facing away from them. We also know they'll never be able to see these triangles in these chunks. So rather than creating one mesh for each chunk, we'll create six. The first mesh only contains triangles that are facing up. The second only contains triangles that are facing down, and so on. We're still only using one buffer and one draw command, but we have an extra step to only render the meshes that are facing the player. The vertex shader is no longer wasting time on triangles the player can't see, which brings our frames a second up to 14,000. We're now up to the final optimization. Earlier I mentioned that we can only combine faces in one direction, not two. That's because we don't have room to store another 5 bits for the combined horizontal length. But we can make room by deleting the face direction. We can do this because of the shader storage buffer object we created before. Right now it stores the world position of each mesh in each chunk, but we can also store the face direction of each mesh. This works because now each chunk has a separate mesh for each face direction. So in the vertex shader, we'll replace our face code with the SSBO. We now have 5 bits free in our vertex data, which is enough to store the second combined face length. By combining faces in two directions, we've reduced our triangle count down to 79,000. This is now running at 17,000 frames per second, which is the highest it'll go. Compared to the start, we're using a tiny fraction of our original memory usage and triangle count. This reduction is the main reason it's rendering so much faster. You can run these demos yourself and experiment with the code. Details are in the video description. There are three more optimizations that I use to render massive amounts of terrain, which you can watch in this video on screen.